Good morning, everyone. This is Jer. Welcome to Kindersley Alliance Church. There is a ladies' meeting every Tuesday at 1 p.m. on Zoom, and every Thursday there is coffee for everyone at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Contact the church for access. There has been a financial update emailed to you. If you have not received it, please contact the church. We have communion this Sunday, so please make sure you have your elements ready. Come join us in worship. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. So welcome here. Thank you for being with us this morning. As I was driving out here to Brenda's today, we're in her beautiful music room. I was struck by the world around me and the magnificence of it and this God who's created it. And I was reminded that how we worship and the words that we say, especially in the climate we're in right now, the words that we say matter because we're influenced by those words. And there's a quote that says, we are formed by what we sing. And so I thought, what does God wanna form in us today? And as I was praying, just the, the bigness of God, yet the intimacy of God, his, um, his sovereignty, his goodness, his power, his love, all of those things that are true and how he loves us. We wanna sing those today. And we're going to introduce a new song to our Kindersley Alliance Church family. It's called um, God of Angel Armies, Who Shall I Fear? And my favorite line in it is the one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. And I think that really reflects God. He is in control over everything and he created everything and he is our friend. So will you join us please as we sing and worship to him together?
Welcome and good morning, everyone. I hope that you've had a great week. Uh, you need to know that uh, I am joining you in this. I'm sitting with my family right now in our living room, and we are participating with you in this worship service, and you are so welcome here. I want to encourage you, please, write a comment. Write a comment on Facebook or on YouTube. Let us know that you're here. Engage with us a bit. Write something down. Let us know how you're doing. Give us a note, something. I want to create an atmosphere where you engage. So please be willing to do that. We miss you. I miss you. I want to offer a very warm welcome to those who live far away those who are not in Kindersley. And I particularly want to welcome today the Norfolk County Seniors Home in Norfolk County, Ontario. We received a message from you this week saying that you would be joining with us in our worship service on an ongoing basis. We love that you're here. We love that you can meet with us. I actually know Ontario a little bit and I know where you are. My grandmother is a resident at that senior's home. Hi, Grandma. I love you and I miss you. This Sunday is a Sunday that uh, is a little different than most in that we are having communion. Now, we have communion every month. We have it on the first Sunday of every month, which is where we find ourselves today. And we are pleased to do it. Depending on the tradition that you grew up in, you might have a certain ritual that uh, this is how communion is done. And we certainly have our own practices. But I want you to know that we are a comfortable church. And we are a church that will invite you into community even if you don't have the right stuff. Today I will be using grape juice. And the reason I'm using grape juice is because I have grape juice. It is both the color of blood, or close to it, and it also is close to what Jesus drank. He had wine, which comes from grapes. I'm having juice that comes from grapes. But you need to know that's not crucial to entering into communion. It's a symbol. The bread is also a symbol. If you came to church on a regular Sunday, we would have unleavened bread. But even at that, we would have unleavened bread that is made with milk, and we would have unleavened bread that is made without. We would also have a gluten-free option because people have different needs. Jesus didn't have those things. He had bread. So if you don't have bread at home, I want you to feel comfortable to get what you do have. We have heard about people who have used bread. We have heard about people who have used crackers. We have heard about people who have used wafers. All of this is fine. We've even heard about people, and I am one of these people, who have used a piece of a donut. It's what I had. And what I wanted was the community and the memory of what Jesus did. And so I entered into communion with what I have, and I would encourage you to do that. If it is coffee, if it is milk, if it is water, if it is grape juice, it's okay. I want you to press pause here. And go get the elements, both what you will eat and what you will drink, and bring them together. And bring enough for everyone around you. Go ahead, hit pause here. We'll wait for you. Before we begin, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to the people who have worked hard to put this surface service together. Brenda and her worship teams, you just saw her playing the piano and singing. Uh, Mandy sang along with her. Thank you, you two. It sounded wonderful. I, I got that uh, recording early in the week, and I've been listening to it throughout the week. It, it's really wonderful. You sound great. To um, Blanca, who's put together the children's program, uh, we know that that is a huge amount of work for you, and you are learning a new skill as we all are. Thank you for being willing to do that. To the people uh, behind the scenes who are doing editing, Carmen, uh, if you know Carmen, you'll know that she's sort of our, uh, she's a, a quiet-natured person who works at the church. She's done a huge amount of work. You are my hero. Thank you for doing that work. Have you ever lost the plot? Have you ever been having a conversation that started over here and something happened in the conversation and suddenly we're talking over here and we never quite come back to here? 
You might notice that later on in the day you'll be sitting there and you'll think to yourself, we didn't even have the conversation I came there to have. We didn't even accomplish what I hoped to accomplish. I lost the plot. If you ever listen to a sermon that at the end of the sermon you weren't quite sure what it was about? Or have you ever preached a sermon that at the end of the sermon you aren't quite sure what it was about? That's something that might have only happened to me, but uh, I've done that and I have lost the plot. I'm going to try hard today not to lose the plot and I would encourage you to track along. Have you ever lost the plot? There's something that happens on a Monday morning. It happens every Monday morning. It's something I look forward to all week. I get up in the morning and my wife and I get into the car and we go out on a Monday morning date. Now you need to know that Mondays tend to be my day off and so we are free to do that and we're free to sort of take up our time. Until recently we used to go to a restaurant and we would sit at a table and we would talk and we would laugh. More recently, we take our food, put it in the car, and we drive somewhere that's pretty, that's good to look at. It's private, and we talk, and we laugh, and we eat together, and we date each other. I know that dating my wife is an important way of me caring for our relationship, and it's something that we prioritize and we do. If you call me on a Monday morning, I'm not available. In fact, I'm not going to answer the phone. You'll have to wait because I am called to care for this marriage and I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to be with my wife. That's our Monday mornings. But very often, more often than I would like to admit, more often than I'd like you to know about, I lose the plot. And here's what it looks like. We climb into our car and I say, where do you want to go eat? And she says, I don't know, you pick. Every week. I don't know why. Every week. Where do you want to go? I don't know, you pick. And so I pick one of two places. Now in our town in Kindersley, it's not difficult. We don't have a plethora of restaurants. But even years ago when I lived in a major city, I would still pick between two restaurants. And after a while, my wife might get tired of it and she would give a third option and we would go there. But I make this choice. And we start to drive. And just with regularity, I forget that we're going to a restaurant, a restaurant that we always go to, a restaurant I could drive there in my sleep. I forget that we're going there and I click to autopilot and I start driving, I don't know where, but somewhere not to the restaurant. Perhaps it's to work, that's the place where I drive to most often. You might be able to relate to that. Uh, but I don't know, I just start driving and at a certain point my wife says to me, where are you going? Are you on autopilot? And I kind of sheepishly laugh and I say, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what I was doing. I, I lost the plot. And we turn around and we drive back to wherever it is that we're going and we have breakfast and it is a good time. But I have lost the plot. The thing that I look forward to all week, the thing that I know is good, that I know is, is, is a wonderful and true part of our relationship. And I've lost that. Have you ever lost the plot? If you grew up in a church where we used liturgy, or where, where we would say things over and over again, you might know what this is. Someone will go up onto the stage and say, God is good, and then the congregation says, all the time. And then the person on stage says, all the time. And then the congregation says, God is good. And we say this back and forth, and we know that this is true. The Bible teaches us that this is true, but there's also evidence of that in our life. In Psalm chapter 100, verse 5, there is this verse, and I'm going to read this to you. And I'm reading this out of different versions in the Bible than you might be used to, because we know that people are watching from all over the world. And so we're trying to use the different versions of Scripture that all say the same thing, but we'll say it in a way that you're familiar with. And so this is in the Living Bible, Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is always good. He is always loving and, and kind, and His faithfulness goes on and on for each succeeding generation. This means the Lord is good, and the Lord is good forever. He always has been good, and He always will be good 
be it for your generation or the generations to come. How do we understand that God is good? Well, you go back a little bit into the book of Psalms, Psalm 34, verse 9, and I'm reading this out of the message. Worship God if you want the best. Worship opens doors to all of his goodness. I want to explain this to you a little bit. I'm going to pull back from this verse. I'm going to tell you a few things that, that uh, I think will be helpful for us. First of all, as humans, we are created to worship. And we're created to be in community with God. When we are in community with God, the world cries out and says, God is good. Have you ever been with someone as they're walking around and you'll say, boy, look at that nice green grass. And the person you're walking with, with will say, isn't God good? And you'll say, I got to go home now. I've got to go see the people who live in my house. I've got to go see those I care about. I've got to go see my friends. Or maybe I'm going to make a phone call. Or, or maybe I'm just going to go home and I'm going to be in the quiet. And I'm going to read a book. Or I'm going to turn on some music. Or maybe I'm just going to sit in silence. And the person you're with says, wow, isn't God good? And you know that it's true, but you look at them and you think, how is that what comes to your mind so quick, all the time? God is good. It's because, Psalm 34, verse 9, worship God if you want the best. Worship opens doors to all of his goodness. Have you ever been struggling? And have you ever been wondering, why are these bad things happening? Have you ever been, maybe, maybe today in, in, in lieu of the coronavirus and everything that's happening there, and you think, I'm scared. And I'm scared because there are, there are different events that are, that are very serious. I, I, I'm worried about impending financial devastation through our, through our country, through our town, in my own life. I don't know how I'm going to deal with the money situation. Or maybe I'm worried because there are many people that don't seem to be taking this, this uh, epidemic seriously. They, they don't seem to be taking this illness seriously. And that worries me. Or maybe you're worried about uh, the expansion of uh, the, the authority that the government has and the ability for them to open things and close things. And you think, that was never what was supposed to happen. When I voted, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I was looking for. And I'm worried about that. I'm worried about these many things. Or perhaps this is not your concern at all. Perhaps there's something else happening, something that is even bigger. You might be worried about your child or your parents, your grandparents. You'll notice that people are getting older and that scares you. There might be something happening at work and there is just worry and you're nervous. And you, your mind does not flash to that God is good. I want to encourage you in those times, worship God. When you're scared, choose to worship God. Turn on some worship music. Sing some songs. Pray to God. Tell God what's going on and worship God. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And worship opens doors to his goodness. Worship allows you to see the good things that he has done. It takes your mind from here and recenters it on the plot. And the plot is that God is good. Even in hard times, even in times that are scary, even in times that cause us concern, God is good. But what happens if we lose the plot? And that's something that has happened many times. It's happened to me. It might have happened to you. We lose the plot when we choose not to trust. We lose the plot when we begin to question, deep in our heart, when we begin to question, is God good? And there's something that's a little bit sinister that also happens, where we will we'll begin to think, because God is good, he's going to have to fix this bad thing. He's going to have to... Make it so that this bad thing isn't happening. Maybe he's going to have to heal. He's going to have to stop 
COVID. He's going to have to intervene. And then there's this quiet whisper that says, and if he doesn't, he either doesn't exist, or I have to question, is God good? We lose the plot when we choose not to trust. And trust is a choice. Have you ever played the game where you stand up on a chair and you fall back into the arms of a bunch of people? This is something that happens in team building uh, exercises. We do this and it's fun and people fall and they kind of bend in the middle and they try to cushion the blow and of course there's many people there holding on to, to catch you. And trust is built that way. With the people that you love, with the people that you're closest to, one thing that is always true is that these people are the most trustworthy people you know. Those are the people you are closest to. Trust is a choice. And we lose the plot when we choose not to trust. In Romans chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, and I'm going to be reading this out of the message. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate. As our distrust accumulates, as that piles on, this angers God. As people try to put a shroud over the truth. What is the truth? The truth is that God is good. But as we try to cover that up and we try to say, look, it either is true that God isn't good, or maybe it's true that God isn't involved, but I'm good, or someone else is good, or someone has done something, and, I, and I'm living, I'm living on, on uh, the goodness of other people, and I'm living on the goodness of my own acts, my own uh, abilities, my own, my own work ethic. And we put a shroud over the truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes, and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power. This means that God reveals himself to us. That God reveals his goodness to us. And I think back to the other verse where if you want to see what goodness God is doing, then worship him. And if you worship him, it is revealed, even though your eyes can't see it. All you can see is sickness. All you can see is a lifestyle that has radically changed in this last couple of months. That's touched all parts of our life. Or maybe you'll see devastation in other countries. Maybe you're a type of person who is aware of when the news talks about genocide in different countries. Or, or talks about uh, sexism and racism. When talks when uh, violence towards people, to single moms who don't have enough, to children who grow up without fathers, all of these things. And our eyes go there. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power. For instance and the mystery of his divine being. So no one has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well. But when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion, so that there was neither a sense nor direction in their lives. People knew God perfectly well. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. People know this. But when they didn't treat him like God, when they didn't worship him, when they refused to worship him, and this is one of these sneaky things. Uh, we hear this all the time, and sometimes I hear this out of my own mouth. I don't feel like worshiping. It's just not in me to worship him today. There's too much bad stuff. I'm too tired. I'm too stressed. I don't have enough sleep. I don't have enough money. There's too much going on in my life. I don't have time to worship him. But when they, did, when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion. So that there was neither a sense, there was neither sense nor direction left in their life. Now that I felt. 
I have felt like my life doesn't make sense. That I have all these plans, I have done all this preparation, I have all these boxes, all these check marks, these things that were going to happen just so, and for whatever reason, they're not happening. My life does not make sense and there isn't any direction. They, prepare, they pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. I love this. I love the imagery of these. These cheap figurines. You can buy them at roadside stands. Those, those figurines that they might be electronic figurines. So some really good electronics. Some stuff that, man, you push some buttons and an amazing thing will happen. Or they might be these figurines that, that uh, they, they, boy, they just look a whole lot like a bank account, don't they? They look a whole lot like the amount of money you have, stocks, bonds, cash, property. Maybe it's something that you drive around. You, you've traded this in for these figurines, this drive around stuff, or fly around, or float around. It might be the world's best computer. It might be the shiniest stuff you can put on your body. There's all this stuff. You can buy this anywhere. If you have enough money, it's easy to get. But we traded the glory of God for this. He holds the whole world in his hands. And that's what we've traded for these cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Your flip and callous arrogance in these areas bother me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast, too, is a small thing, but it works its way through the whole batch of bread dough pretty fast. So get rid of this yeast. Our true identity is a flat and it, our true identity is flat and plain, not puffed up with the wrong kind of ingredient. This is a strange thing to read because we think about yeast. Isn't yeast good? Doesn't yeast make something that's flat and hard, puffy and, and, and good? And, and this is a good loaf of bread. This is good nourishment. But for the illustration here, yeast is used as a bad thing. Use, yeast is something that takes something that is complete and takes something that is good and works its way through all of the ingredients, touching all parts of it, forever changing it. This is what the foolishness of losing the plot does. It touches all parts of our life. Have you ever met someone who has a pride issue? It touches all parts of their life. There's no part of their life they're not humble. There's no part of their life that they are humble. There's parts of their life they will hide from you. You can't come into this room in my house because it's a mess. And you look at them and you say, what do I care if your room is a mess? I'm not here to see the room. I'm here to be with you. But their pride won't allow them to open that door to show you. These are people who are often, uh, they want you to think that they're perfect. They never leave the house without being properly attired, properly dressed, perhaps it's makeup, hairbrush, something like that. They've got to be perfect. It's a pride thing. You never get to know them. Or perhaps it's someone who is driven entirely by financial gain. The farm has to be bigger. The business has to be bigger. You have to do one more thing. There's always one more thing that you can do. And this little bit of yeast, that little bit of pride, this little bit of financial gain, whatever this is, this thing that takes your eyes off of God, that takes off of the plot that God is good, works its way through our entire life. The Messiah is our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed for the Passover meal. And we are the unraised bread part of the feast. This, is, this, was, this was what they would eat. This was unleavened bread. We are. And we are the unraised bread part of the, fat, of the feast. So let's live out our part in the feast, not as raised bread swollen with the yeast of evil, but as flat bread, simple, genuine, and unpretentious. The plot 
when we have got hold of the plot, when we know that God is good, and when we know that God is good even when the world is wrong, even when the world is sick, even when the world is fearful, God is still good. We don't need God to act as we instruct him to do in order for him to be good. If that was true, if God needed to do that, what we've done is we've taken our place, we've taken ourselves and put us in the place of God. And we have an idolatry problem. If God has to respond in a certain way to prove that he is good, we have an idolatry problem. And we've lost the plot. In those times of fear, when we look at those who are sick, when we look at those who are dying, perhaps it's even ourselves. When we look at those who are lost, when we look at our children, we need to understand that Jesus has already died on the cross for our sins. He has already died on the cross for the sins of the world. And God is good. The completion of this story is already present. We know that when we die, those who believe, we go to heaven. Those who choose relationship with God and choose Him to be our God and that we put our trust in Him. And there is evidence that this has happened. Those things are called the fruit of the Spirit. When that happens, we know that God is good. And anything can happen around us. Christianity itself can become illegal, as has happened in many countries over time. We can, we can expect that God is coming back, and when he comes back, there's a, 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 things are made right. That which is wrong is made right. But until that happens, God is still good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Whenever we are in a place where we don't believe that, that is the time we need to worship God. We need to choose to worship God. When we feel distrustful of God, when we feel that maybe God isn't engaged, that is the time where we need to worship God. And through our worship of Him, He will reveal to us His goodness. And that is the plot. And we call to Him. Something that I encounter fairly often is people saying, I have called to God many times, and I've never heard him respond. I've called out to God, God answer me, and I have never heard him respond. I want to encourage you to continue to call out to him. And I want you to encourage you to get a group of people around you to call out to him while you are calling out to him, and have everyone listen. You'll find he does speak. You'll find that the wisest people you know all say the same thing. God speaks to me. God is good. Psalm 69, chapter, verse 16. Now answer me, God, because you love me. Let me see your great mercy full face. God, I am calling out to you. Let me see the good that you are doing. Even though there's all kinds of stuff in the world that's bad, let me see the good that you are doing. Let me see where you work. Let me see your fingerprints in the world around me. Let me see how that the grass is turning green, how that's good, even though the COVID stuff is scary. Even though people aren't taking it seriously, some. Even though we are worried about the finances. Even though we're worried about the government's actions. We're worried about these things. Show me that you're good. Because you love me, show me that you are good. The tone of that is very different than God fix COVID. And if you don't, I don't think you're good. If that is the prayer... Even if you don't include that last part, but God, you have to do it. You've lost the plot. And the plot is, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. There is an author who I uh, like very much, and uh, he wrote a book called Soul Care. And it's a book that we work through uh, as, a, as a, a, a church uh, in different parts and also through the whole book. And he says this. 
Jesus is unrelenting beauty, untarnished goodness, unstoppable grace, unending love, unflappable peace. He never errors, never wins, never has impure motives. He has an eternally trustworthy track record. Just camp on that. Always since forever, he has a trustworthy track record. You can trust him without taking offense, even in the darkest seasons of life. You can trust him. For some of you, this might be new information. For some of you, this might ring true to you and you don't know why. I want to invite you to enter into relationship with Jesus Christ so that he will teach you the truth of who he is. He will teach you that he is good. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, all three separate, all three one. And they are good. The authority of God, the grace of Jesus, and the relationship of with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that speaks to us. All of it good through all eternity. I want to invite you into relationship with Him. For some of you, perhaps you've known this, and you know this to be true in your mind, but the extension cord between your mind and your heart is broken. I want you to pray, and I want you to worship. I want you to pick a worship song and sing it. And every time your heart twists and you're just not sure, worship God and call to him and say, show me your goodness, the goodness that you've had through all generations. Show me your goodness. For some of you, this is a reminder of what you know to be true and the evidence is so clear in your heart. For you, I'm asking you to do this. Pray for the rest of us. Pray for those who struggle. Pray for those who don't know. Pray by name. Pray that they will see God's goodness and they won't lose the plot. I'm going to close this in prayer. And in my prayer, I'm going to instruct you on if you want to have that relationship with Jesus Christ, here's how you do it. Pray this prayer after me. And once that's done, we're going to enter into communion. Bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, I ask that you come into my heart. I ask that you show me your goodness. Lord, become my God. Take away the things that are not of you, the different idols, those shiny objects that can be bought at any roadside stand. I give those to you. And instead I claim the truth of who you are. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it is so important that you give us a little note. We want to celebrate with you. We also want to build a community around you of people that will support you and love you and show you the truth. You need to know that there is no condemnation in Jesus. There is only love. Lies stand in the way of love. All of God's judgment is aimed at whatever interferes with his love. So please leave a note. Now we are entering into the part of the service called communion. Uh, it represents the Last Supper, which is something that we read about in Matthew chapter 26. This is when Jesus and his disciples were having supper. It happened just before he died. And he's given us instruction on how to do this. Communion is for people who believe that Jesus is God and that God is Lord, is their Lord, is Lord of their life. This is for people who have confessed with their mouths and believe with their minds and with their hearts that Jesus is God. And we do this together. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. I invite you to bow with me. Lord God, we take this piece of bread, this cracker, whatever we've got today, Lord. We ask you to bless it 
and we eat this in memory of your body broken for us. I invite you to make sure each person has a piece of this. And let's eat together. And then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my body, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. I invite you to take your glass and bow with me in prayer. Lord God, We remember what you did. Your blood spilled out for us on purpose. You, a willing sacrifice. You are a good God. We remember that. We drink this together to remember that. Amen. Let's partake together. And then Jesus says this, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We are going to see him again. He's preparing a place for us. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We'll see you next Sunday.